What's up, everybody? Everybody. <laughs> Morning. DC here. We are waiting on the United States Senate Committee hearing on agriculture, nutrition, and forestry entitled Hemp Production and the 2018 Farm Bill. That's right. Tuesday, we had a big, uh, big hearing in the Senate, first ever. And here we are talking about hemp. So we thought we'd bring it to you. I would bring it to you live. Waiting for them to start up. They are broadcasting. And uh, as soon as they get up and going, we will get up and going and uh, chime in. I got to make some coffee. Just took Chella to work. And um, I'm going to make some coffee to enjoy this hearing. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be more I'm sure it'll be more entertaining than yesterday's hearing. <laughs> Airings. <laughs> oh man. All right. All right guys, we're coming up. Stay tuned. I got to make coffee. Here's some more music.
remarks, both the ranking member and I received a letter regarding hemp production from the Association of American Pesticide Control Officials, and there is a separate letter from the Drug Policy Alliance regarding the hemp felon ban that I submit for the record today without objection. Page two. <laughs> Today's hearing on hemp production first convenes the three federal agencies that direct, directly regulate or affect uh, hemp uh, cultivation. The USDA is preparing a rule on hemp as directed by the Farm Bill. FDA is faced with issues that are relevant to processor demand for this crop. And EPA will play an integral role in how producers raise this crop through the choices available to them. This hearing is designed to provide a forum for the agencies to discuss the decision they are facing, as well as stakeholders' uh, perspectives regarding the USDA rule in development. On today's second panel, the committee will hear from those on the ground as they provide insight from the producer, industry, and tribal regulatory perspectives. I have talked repeatedly about two themes here in this committee, providing certainty and predictability for farmers, However, this developing industry has a great opportunity, but to be truthful, it has much uncertainty and risk for farmers. Hemp was only recently removed from the Federal Controlled Substances Act because of its historical legal problems. Hemp agronomics suffer from a relatively short history of data research and good farming practices compared to other new crops that we've seen ramp up towards more significant acreage in the past. Farmers bear significant risk regarding hemp production, regardless of their operations business model. A producer may share risk through a contract to grow hemp for a processor, with the processor providing an input such as seed. Though there have been instances when some growers may not have always received timely payments by a processor. And a different farmer may grow hemp to sell either the fiber, grain, seed hemp, or flour on the open market. At present, there is not a federal multi peril crop insurance available to generally cover lost production costs. And there is a need for production data to develop any new revenue insurance policy. These are cautions regarding this new crop, but let me be clear, I am extremely supportive of new opportunities for farmers. Everybody here on this committee, or especially the leader who has provided a lot of leadership in this regard, it's not often that almost in an entirely new crop with this level of interest and market potential comes along. I'm proud to say we even have new facilities now being built in Russell, Kansas. As we all know, times are tough. Our producers across the country have been experiencing increased cost and low commodity prices over the past several years. On top of that, many farmers dealt with Mother Nature's wrath this morning as flooding prevented many from getting a crop or a quality crop in the ground. These economic conditions drive further margin erosion and financial stress for many operations. However, producers and agriculture stakeholders continue to look for ways to adopt to the downturn in agriculture prices. Many are positioning themselves for longer-term opportunities that might wa warrant further investment or provide an additional profit opportunity. So today, we are here to ask questions, learn from the stakeholders, and better understand the multitude of issues surrounding help, pardon me, hemp, uh, cultivation, and this industry. I support the implementation of the 2018 Farm Bill in a farmer-friendly manner, and hemp is no exception. And needless to say, based upon my history with the Federal Fungicide, Insecticide, and Rodenticide Act, or FIFRA, I strongly support development of the data and information needed to provide this crop with conventional crop protection tools. But there are complex questions in this space. Is hemp the crop of a generation? What will this industry look like in 10 years? I do not know the answer to these questions, and I'm not sure if anyone can actually answer them. However, witnesses testifying on both panels today have valuable insight to share, facilitating the flow of accurate information regarding this new endeavor, especially as it relates to the pending decisions by the federal agencies, will hopefully be used to the agencies, the industry, and the end and in the end, the farmers upon whom much of this success will be built. I now recognize my distinguished ranking member, Senator Stabenow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to all of our witnesses today. The 2018 Farm Bill includes many new opportunities to strengthen and diversify American agriculture. And we know uh, something about that in Michigan. We grow a wider variety of crops than any other state but one in the country. 
One of the most anticipated opportunities we included in the Farm Bill is what this hearing is all about today, newly legalized production of hemp. This exciting new opportunity is actually part of a great American tradition. George Washington, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson all grew hemp. In fact, maybe Lin-Manuel Miranda will make his next musical about that. Oh, Henry Clay as well. Thank you, Mr. Leader. <laughs> a long history, a long history. During World War II, the USDA encouraged farmers to grow hemp in order to produce rope for the U.S. Navy. Michigan's own Henry Ford saw great potential in hemp and experimented with using it in bio-based manufacturing. In fact, hemp used to be so prevalent in my state, they say you could drive down the side of the road, see it on the side of the road while driving down I-94 in southeast Michigan. This new old crop is creating exciting opportunities for farmers and the greater supply chain. Hemp producers or hemp products are already popular in the U.S. marketplace as we know. Nationally, it's estimated that U.S. hemp retail sales are at more than $700 million annually, and this market is expected to grow at 10 to 20 percent. According to the Michigan Department of Agriculture, more than 30,000 acres have been registered for hemp production. Over 700 growers and processors have received a license to produce hemp and derive products. Michigan farmers can cultivate hemp seeds to make new food products with whole hemp seeds, seed protein, and hemp seed oil. Innovators are looking at ways to use industrial hemp in bio-based manufacturing. There's exciting potential to create products like biodegradable water bottles, construction materials, clothing, and even cement to improve our roads. Because hemp is a new crop, more research is still needed to provide information to producers on the right soils and seeds, pest management techniques, and other best practices. In order to support growers and processors, we need to conduct aggressive research. Just last week, this committee discussed the concerns and the loss of researchers at the Department of Agriculture driven by the relocation of two USDA research agencies. And I mentioned that the USDA is losing irreplaceable expertise, their top researcher on hemp as a result of the move. Instead of throwing away knowledge, the department should be doing everything it can to continue important work that will help our farmers succeed. In addition to research, farmers need access to adequate financing to cover the high cost of seeds and new equipment. It's also critical that entrepreneurs have capital to build the infrastructure needed to process hemp, which will create exciting new business opportunities in rural communities. We also need to ensure that these opportunities in hemp production are fair and equitable for all farmers. It's also critical there's fair testing and enforcement of harvesting hemp across the board. With any change, there's always questions that need to be addressed, and that's why we're here today. There are still many outstanding federal and local issues related to CBD oil, risk management tools, and testing methods for harvesting hemp crops. So I look forward to uh, the panel of experts that we have today who will speak to all of these issues and uh, give us an opportunity to learn more about the implementation of these provisions. And Mr. Chairman, I also have to apologize in advance. As you know, uh, we have a markup going on in the Finance Committee. I have amendments I'm offering, so as I indicated to the witnesses, I apologize for uh, moving back and forth, but it's the reality of try trying to be two places at once, which we're frequently challenged to do. So welcome again. I recognize the dilemma we face with the hearings in the Finance Committee. I'll be there on final passage, but I, I was going to say I wish you luck on your amendments. I'm not too sure that I wanted to say that. <laughs> Can I count you as a yes, Mr. Chairman? Yes, I know, right. No, I don't think you do, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I have three, but I have uh, withdrawn them, so we can get this on the road. I am very pleased and privileged to represent uh, Leader McConnell, uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, 
Uh, if it had not been for him, I'm not sure we would have put the emphasis we did in the Farm Bill. Uh, it was through his suggestion and gentle nudging, uh, not so gentle nudging, <laughs> uh, that uh, we are on the road we are on. And it's been a long time coming, and, it, and, the, uh, and the time is now. Uh, Leader McConnell, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and Senator Stabenow for your <coughs> willingness to be leaned on, not that, not that you needed it. Um, this was a, an extraordinary development that we're all excited about in last year's Farm Bill. Kentucky, I gather, like Michigan, has a long history with hemp. I'm glad it's making a comeback, and it's uh, created incredible excitement all across uh, my state. When we began the pilot programs as a result of language that I put in, thanks to you, Mr. Chairman, and others back in 2014, I believe you were chairman then, we put in pilot projects in the 2014 Farm Bill. As we all know, and as the chairman and Senator Stabenow pointed out, this product is incredible, uh, from food to clothing <clears throat> to wellness products. Uh, what a diversified uh, product. I'm especially grateful to the two of you. It was fun being there with the president. A little awkward for the senator from Michigan, but she, she, uh, she was there for the signing of the bill, I recall. Wondering what she was doing. It was almost an out-of-body experience, I'm sure. But uh, we were all there together, which underscored, I think, the bipartisan nature of the, of the effort that went into putting together uh, last year's farm bill. It was exciting to see the president sign it. Um, I had Secretary Purdue down just a week or two ago on a hemp-focused visit, and um, I think USDA is trying to be helpful in every way they can. Um, the biggest thing they have to come up with, as I think all of us know, is crop insurance, which isn't going to be there for the 2019 crop, but the Secretary's uh, assured us all, and I've helped him do that by writing it into one of the bills we recently passed, that at least the the whole crop crop insurance will be ready for next year. Uh, getting crop insurance for specific hemp is going to take more time. But whole crop, I mean, whole farm uh, crop insurance will be available for hemp next year. All the agencies are playing a vital role in this. You're going to hear from them. Uh, EPA and FDA obviously have a role to play in all of this. I've got a constituent here today that I'm awfully proud of. Uh, Brown Furnish. <clears throat> Brown is an eighth generation farmer who's going to be on the second panel <clears throat> from Cynthiana. When he purchased his first farm back in the late 1990s, he turned to what had been our big cash crop, tobacco. Tobacco's history in Kentucky and across our country goes way back to the founding of our country. There are tobacco leaves at various places painted in the capital was an integral part of the beginning of this country. <clears throat> to show you how pervasive tobacco was in, <clears throat> in our state when I first came here <clears throat> to the Senate, we grew at least some of it in 119 of 120 counties. It was everywhere. Under the old quota system set up during the New Deal, they actually measured your historical production <clears throat> assigned that quota to your farm, and it added value to your farm. I mean, you paid property taxes on it. So the government created the asset, and um, it distributed the income into a lot of different hands and provided an awful lot of income for an awful lot of people for, an awful, for a very long time. What happened next to Brian is the same story that's been shared by thousands of farm families in Kentucky, demand for tobacco started falling. Foreign competition grew. So in collaboration with leading Kentuckians like Brian Furnish, who's here today, I introduced the tobacco buyout legislation in 2004 <clears throat> to help free tobacco growers from the Depression-era quota system. Signed it into law in 2004, in 04, um, levied a, a fee on the producers, and we basically bought back the asset that the government had created back in the 30s, compensated them for the asset that had been created by the government back in the 30s. <clears throat> that 10-year buyout <clears throat> ended in 2014. So 
that's coincided with the 2014 Farm Bill, where we all worked together to put in pilot uh, projects in the hopes that maybe, just maybe, hemp could be a really big deal sometime in the future. So Brian and dozens of other Kentucky farmers hit the ground running with the pilot program just as the quota buyout over the 10-year period ended. <clears throat> The hemp legislation that I offered and, and you all were happy to, to accept and participate in um, couldn't have come at a better time. Uh, Brian has grown different strains of hemp for fiber, for seed, for CBD. In addition to farming hemp, he's also had experience processing the crop. So he's not the only one beginning benefiting from hemp's resurgence in my state. Right now, farmers in 101 of 120 counties in just one year of legalization, or six months of legalization, actually. We're now growing it at 101 out of 120 counties. That's how fast it's gone in our state. We have more than 200 processors operating in our state, and this has only been legal for six months. It was recently announced that around $100 million worth of Kentucky-grown and processed hemp products are expected to be sold this year alone. Uh, look, I don't think we, any of us know if hemp will ever be as big as in Kentucky as Burley Tobacco, but with farmers like Brian leading the effort, I'm confident we have a bright future with this crop in our state. So as the committee reviews the implementation of the hemp initiative, I can think of no better voice to hear from than Brian Furnish. I'm pleased to welcome. I want him to stand up. I think he's got his daughter with him. There you are, Brian. His daughter, Gracie. She's on the national, she's one of the national FAA officers last year and is currently attending the University of Kentucky. <clears throat> she's following in her dad's footsteps as a strong voice for Kentucky agriculture. So I'm thrilled that, that Brian and Gracie could be here today. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator Stabenow, again for your consistent interest in this. I think this is a necessary hearing as we sort of deal with the last three things. If you, if you look at this as a football, we're in the red zone. We're not quite in the end zone yet. We're in the red zone. There are three issues out there. The crop insurance issue, which we discussed. The people who are growing it this year are pioneers. They're out there without the insurance, taking a chance. Uh, FDA, you're going to hear from them <clears throat> what kind of representations can be made that reassure the public and don't overstate. Uh, we have some banking issues. I'm not clear whether you're going to hear from them or not, but there have been some credit card issues. Uh, there are some EPA issues. You've got them on the schedule here today. So I want to conclude by thanking you all for doing this. Uh, I think we're close to the end zone on this, and we're all hopeful <clears throat> it's going to be a really big deal in a whole lot of states, maybe even in Kansas, and we'll see what the future holds. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, and good luck, Brian. These are really tough questioners, so be, I'm sure you're nervous as you can possibly be. Well, Leader, uh, if we're in the red zone, I'm going to let you call some of the plays. You could just go up the middle, but I don't think you're gaining uh, much uh, in many yards. I think the end around uh, a situation might work out pretty good. We'll work on that one. Our first witness is the Honorable Greg Ibaugh, Under Undersecretary for Marketing and Regulatory Programs, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, Greg is USDA's Undersecretary for Marketing and Regulatory Programs. This includes the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service and the Agriculture Marketing Service, the USDA Agency for Administering the Implementation of the Hemp uh, uh, Production Provisions within the 218 Farm Bill. Greg, we welcome you back. Our next witness is the Honorable Stephen Vaden, General Counsel of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, Stephen is General Counsel to the U.S. Department uh, of Agriculture, where he provides legal advice and service across the department and its agencies, including implementation of the hemp production provisions of the 218 Farm Bill. Greg, welcome back to you, too. Pardon me, Stephen. The Honorable Alexandra Dunn uh, is uh, here to represent the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, Ms. Dunn currently serves as the Assistant Administrator for the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention 
at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. In this capacity, she oversees the Office of Pesticide Programs, the Office of uh, Pollution Prevention and Toxics, and the Office of Science uh, Coordination and Policy. Uh, are welcome to you, ma'am. Our last witness, at least in the first panel, is Dr. Amy Abernethy. She is the Principal Deputy Commissioner of Food and Drugs, U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Uh, she is the Principal Deputy Commissioner of Food and Drugs at FDA. Dr. Abernethy oversees the agency's day-to-day -day functioning and directs special and high-priority initiatives that cut across the offices overseeing the FDA's regulation of drugs, medical devices, tobacco, and food. To that point, she is co-chair of the FDA's internal CBD policy working group. We welcome you, ma'am, as well. Uh, Greg, why don't you start this off? Thank you, Chairman Roberts, Ranking Member Stabenow. I uh, appreciate this opportunity to appear before you today to discuss USDA's implementation of the hemp provisions contained in the 2018 Farm Bill. I am Greg Ibaugh, Undersecretary for USDA's Marketing and Regulatory Programs Mission Area, which includes the Ag Marketing Service and the, and the agency that is charged with implementing the core hemp provisions of the bill. And with me today is USDA General Counsel Stephen Baden. The Office of the General Counsel has been a valuable partner as we work uh, towards implementation of the 18 Farm Bill hemp provisions. We know there is a lot of interest around the country in the economic potential for hemp production. I'm sure you have heard from farmers in your districts about the importance of USDA issuing clear regulations and moving quickly to do so. With that in mind, I would like to provide you with a synopsis of USDA's hemp-related activities since enactment of the Farm Bill last December. I will also provide the committee with the department's plans moving forward. As you know, the 2018 Farm Bill authorized the production of hemp and removed hemp and hemp seeds from the Drug Enforcement Administration's Schedule of Controlled Substances. USDA is required to issue regulations and guidelines to implement a program for the commercial production of industrial hemp in the United States. The rulemaking will outline provisions for USDA to approve plans submitted by states and Indian tribes for the domestic production of hemp as set forth by the Farm Bill. It will also establish a federal plan for producers in states or territories of Indian tribes that do not have their own USDA-approved plan. As outlined by the Farm Bill, the program includes provisions for maintaining information on the land where hemp is produced, testing THC levels, disposing of plants that are not in compliance with program requirements, licensing requirements, and ensuring compliance. For the 2019 planting season, the 2018 Farm Bill provides that states, tribes, and institutions of higher education can continue operating under the authorities of the 2014 Farm Bill, which permitted these entities to produce hemp under pilot programs for research purposes. These authorities will expire 12 months after the effective date of the AMS rule. In addition to AMS, the Farm Service Agency, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and the Risk Management Agency are also impacted by the 2018 Farm Bill's hemp provisions. I would refer you to my written statement for more details on their respective responsibilities. Following passage of the 2018 Farm Bill, AMS participated in hundreds of meetings and consultations with interested entities in Washington, D.C. and across the country. These in entities included states, Congress, tribes, other federal agencies, private businesses, industry organization, and producers. In addition to these meetings, USDA has provided a number of informational documents and engaged the public through information gathering sessions. The following are a few highlights of these activities. On March 13th, USDA held a Farm Bill hemp listening session to allow interested parties to share their perspectives and ideas on hemp production. This was a three-hour webinar with approximately 2,100 participants. The webinar was recorded and is available on our website along with comments that were submitted to AMS. 
On April 18th, a notice to trade was issued which provided guidance to U.S. hemp producers and seed exporters seeking an avenue for hemp seed exports to the United States. In late May, the USDA's Office of General Counsel issued a legal analysis regarding the interstate transportation of hemp and who may obtain a license to produce hemp. Last but, not, but certainly not least, an interim final rule to establish the domestic hemp production program is currently undergoing interagency review. We hope to finalize the rule this fall to accommodate the 2020 crop year. Once the rule is published and becomes effective, USDA will move quickly to fully establish the program. We are unable to comment on the specifics of the rule at this time as it is under interagency review, but we'll be happy to provide more detailed information once it's published. As you can see, USDA is committed to a timely establishment of this program. We look forward to your questions. Uh, to have a prepared statement is the Honorable Alexandra Dunn, uh, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And Ms. Dunn, please proceed. Good morning, Chairman Roberts. Good morning. Thank you for having me here today. I am Alexandra Dunn, Assistant Administrator of the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And it's a privilege to discuss EPA's role in and our plans for regulating hemp and to be here with my colleagues, Dr. Abernathy, Undersecretary Ibach, and General Counsel Vaden. As hemp comes into its own as our nation's newest cash crop, growers will need pesticides approved for use on hemp to ensure healthy and stable crops. EPA will play a role in helping hemp reach its full potential in three ways. First, EPA can authorize pesticides for use on hemp plants under FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. Second, where hemp products are a food or animal feed, EPA will set tolerances or maximum pesticide residue limits under the Food Quality Protection Act, or FQPA. And then third, EPA is coordinating with our federal partners, state agencies, and others on hemp policy issues. Uh, EPA has a long history of ensuring that pesticides used on U.S. crops are applied safely. EPA approves new pesticide uses in a timely fashion under the Pesticide Registration Improvement Act, or PREA, so that the most cutting-edge and precise pesticides enter the marketplace and are available to growers. And we thank you, Senator, and the committee for your excellent work on PREA's recent reauthorization. I'm pleased to tell you that EPA is committed to assisting hemp producers obtain the pest management tools they need to help them transition to commercial production of this crop. EPA's effective and long-standing methods for working with industry, grower groups, states, and other partners will ensure that producer requirements for pest management and environmental and public health protection can all be met and achieved. So first, as you know, for a crop to be sold in the United States, EPA must approve a pesticide use on that crop and associated pesticide labeling under FIFRA. EPA anticipates an increase in pesticide registrant interest in gaining approval to use pesticides on hemp under FIFRA, particularly thanks to the 2018 Farm Bill and the strong economic forecasts for hemp production. In fact, since May 2019, EPA has received 10 requests to include hemp on existing pesticide labels. We already have an approach for reviewing these requests and are engaging the public in our process. The pending requests notably involve biological and microbial chemicals, which tend to have very low environmental impact and can be approved on an expeditious basis consistent with our authorities. And EPA completing review of these requests will be the first of many actions I anticipate we will take to support growers in the new hemp industry. Second, as mentioned, where hemp products are a food or animal feed, EPA will set tolerances or maximum pesticide residue limits under the FQPA. Notably, the biological and microbial chemicals that I mentioned earlier are exempt from the tolerance requirements, which makes them very available today. 
and we look forward to working with our colleagues in the Food and Drug Administration on other tolerance-related issues. Uh, our decisions are interrelated. So third, coordination on hemp policy between federal partners, states, growers, and other stakeholders is essential to our work. We are engaging with the Department of Agriculture, with FDA, and the Department of Justice. And our shared goal is, of course, to provide uh, coordinated information and regulatory certainty. We are working also with our states as they have a co-regulatory role in administering and enforcing FIFRA. So in conclusion, over time, EPA has proven to be a nimble and adaptive regulator such that innovation in the pesticide marketplace is advanced while public health and the environment are protected. And we stand ready to ensure that EPA takes the pesticide registration actions and sets tolerances necessary so that hemp and hemp products can effectively and safely enter the marketplace. So I appreciate very much the opportunity to testify today and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I thank you very much uh, for an excellent statement, more especially one of the first from any federal agency to finish 30 seconds under the time limit. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Abernathy, <laughs> that doesn't mean that I'm trying to restrict you, ma'am. <laughs> I thought you were handing it over. Good morning, Chairman Roberts and members of the committee. I am Dr. Amy Abernathy, Principal Deputy Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the FDA's role in the regulation of hemp products. I am pleased to join my colleagues from the USDA and EPA to work together to ensure coordination across the federal government. FDA is committed to advancing its regulation of hemp products through an approach that, in line with our mission, prioritizes public health, fosters innovation, and promotes consumer confidence. As a physician, I reflect that patients and consumers trust that the FDA will prioritize their health and protect public safety. As this committee knows, the 2018 Farm Bill unleashed a wave of interest in innovation in hemp agriculture. The Farm Bill removed hemp from the definition of marijuana in the Controlled Substances Act, and the Farm Bill explicitly preserved FDA's authorities over hemp products. Hemp-derived products subject to the FDA's jurisdiction are regulated like any other products, enhancing consumer confidence in this growing hemp market. Hemp products that fall within FDA's responsibilities include food products like hulled hemp seeds and also products that are extracted from hemp derivatives like cannabidiol, such as foods, drugs, and cosmetics. And there's much interest in cannabidiol, otherwise known as CBD. FDA first approved a CBD drug product last year for the treatment of seizures associated with two rare and severe pediatric diseases, a significant milestone for these children and their families. And in line with the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, CBD is available to be marketed for, as this approved drug. Meanwhile, there's been an explosion of CBD-based products like lotions, gummies, and chocolates. Providing clarity on the regulatory status of CBD products is an FDA priority. However, under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, adding CBD to food or marketing a CBD product as a dietary supplement is generally prohibited unless the agency makes an exception through rulemaking. The same rule applies to most active drug ingredients. It's common sense. We generally don't want drugs to be added to food. FDA is a science-based agency. Americans expect that decisions made by FDA are informed by the best available information about safety, and CBD is no exception. So what data do we have? Through the approval of the CBD drug Epidiolex, which was based on adequate and well-controlled clinical studies, FDA learned that CBD is not a risk-free substance. CBD can harm the liver, create a sense of exhaustion, and affect your appetite. When a medical provider prescribes a FDA-approved CBD drug product, the patient can be guided and monitored by the provider. But what about situations where CBD is in your morning cereal? You consume a CBD lossage or you apply CBD skin cream. What if you take these every day together for months or for years? What is the risk if you're pregnant, breastfeeding, a child, elderly, taking other medicines, or suffering a major illness? And what about pets and food-producing animals? 
Prior to the Farm Bill, cannabis-derived CBD was a controlled substance, which meant that research with CBD was very restricted. So, to our knowledge, the studies just haven't been done. In sum, we lack the information for science-based decision-making about CBD. So what is the FDA doing to address this situation? First, we are moving as quickly as possible to learn what is known and develop a work plan to fill in the gaps. We have formed a working group, which I co-chair, to expedite FDA's work. We are re reviewing the published medical literature, all databases available to us, and any available information from industry sponsors. On May 31st, we held a full-day hearing with over 100 speakers and 2,000 participants. A public docket just closed on July 16th, and we received 4,492 comments. We are meeting with our federal partners, state governments, trade organizations, patient groups, and others. Throughout, we have asked for any available data that's already available. Please send it to us. And we have committed to providing an update on our work by early fall. Second, we are providing regulatory clarity whenever possible. FDA already provided clarity that certain hemp products, hauled hemp seed, hemp seed protein powder, and hemp seed oil, can be legally used in human foods. Similarly, the regulatory pathway for new CBD-based drugs is clear, and we understand clinical studies are ongoing. Meanwhile, our working group is actively reviewing all potential regulatory pathways in order to determine the appropriate approach to CBD for other types of products that we regulate, like foods, dietary supplements, animal feeds, and cosmetics. Third, we are taking appropriate steps to protect American patients and consumers. We have issued warning letters to companies marketing CBD with therapeutic claims like treating cancer, Alzheimer's, and opioid withdrawal. And finally, we are working together with our federal partners and state partners and communicating with the public. I cannot emphasize enough how important this is. This is what the Americans expect of us, this is what the committee expects of us, and this is what we as FDA expect of ourselves. Thank you and invite your questions. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Doctor, for an excellent statement. Mr. Faden. I'm not a scientist, but it is my understanding that testing results for total THC, similar to other tests on agriculture products such as feed, have analytical variances. And they are due to random sampling error. Such variances mean that a hemp plant could be at 0.3% in actuality and measure 0.21% or even 39% at a different uh, credible lab. In your opinion, as the general counsel, would the USDA be legally required to implement any testing regime in the upcoming regulation to a strict 0.3 percent with no variations? To be clear, I understand that this is a legal opinion and there may be other policy considerations about which I am not asking the Office of General Counsel uh, for its opinion. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes observed, the life of the law has not been one of logic. It has been one of experience. Thankfully, Congress gave USDA the tools it needs to draw from the experience of the states who have been participating in the 2014 Farm Bill pilot program on hemp in order to understand the best testing methodologies that are available, what their limitations are, and to factor that in with the discretion given to the agency to set up a testing program in order to ensure that the program that we put forward is farmer friendly and does not unwittingly trap farmers who are doing their level best to abide by the point three limit that Congress set in the statute. Uh, Mr. Faden, this is a new and exciting crop. Thank you for that comment, and I underline the farmer, frank, the farmer friendly uh, emphasis that you put on that. I commend the RMA and Leader McConnell for all of their efforts to provide responsible risk management tools for hemp producers. As we all know, good farming practices and actuarial soundness are pillars of the federal crop insurance program. My question is, how will RMA develop or evaluate multi peril policies that include practice standards for this new crop? How will RMA develop or evaluate revenue policies that are based upon crop yield and price data? Well, Senator, RMA will continue as it always has in a way that first and foremost maintains program integrity. 
Uh, RMA will work with stakeholders to ensure that it has sufficient data to have an actuarially sound product. This includes stakeholders such as State Departments of Agriculture, Industry, and the Agriculture Marketing Service, among others, as well as our states and, of course, producers. Furthermore, as was uh, announced by Undersecretary Eyeball in his opening remarks, hemp will be covered under a pilot program, whole farm revenue policy, for the coming crop year in 2020. And as a pilot under the law, RMA can assess the program and make changes as needed to maintain program integrity while also providing a product that is useful for hemp producers. And one final note that I will add, we take note of the fact that Congress put in the 2018 Farm Bill a non-discrimination provision when it comes to hemp. And what that means with regard to RMA is that should any private producer uh, wish to have a policy focused on hemp be evaluated by the Federal Crop Insurance Committee, it will be treated just as any other policy is that goes through that same process and will suffer no additional hurdles or detriments because it is for hemp. I thank you for that statement. Greg, um, Mr. Undersecretary, thank you for all of your efforts over the past seven months regarding the implementation of the 2018 Farm Bill. Not an easy task. I greatly appreciate it. The, the uh, members of this committee appreciate it. And I know it requires tremendous staff effort. I have asked other colleagues of yours at the Department a similar question regarding the bill as you make decisions in rulemaking. Will you commit to me in this committee that the hemp authority within your mission area is going to be implemented in a farmer-friendly manner? As you're aware, Chairman Roberts, uh, Secretary Purdue has uh, charged the entire USDA team to be the most efficient, effective, and customer-focused agency in the federal government. So uh, farmers, as well as processors, are part of our customers in this uh, hemp production uh, world that we're living in now. And so it's very much in our interest, and that's why we're working very closely with states to understand the experiences they have to be able to design programs that they know work for their farmers so that we can design a hemp program at USDA that will also be farmer-friendly. So yes, I do pledge to you that we will be, have a farmer-friendly program as best we can. I appreciate that very much. Administrator Dunn. Reflecting the letter that I submitted in the hearing record, the Interregional re Inter Research Project, or the IR4.4 program, is intended to facilitate the development of conventional pesticides for minor use crops. When will EPA develop the research protocol for HAP, and when will these guideline documents be updated? For that question, Senator, EPA and IR4 are working together now to identify the information that we need to support tolerance petitions for conventional pesticides that would be used on hemp. Coincidentally, a technical meeting on this topic between my staff and IR4 will be held later today, and it was scheduled prior to this hearing. Uh, we have some additional, more extended discussions coming up uh, later this um, summer. And we believe that these uh, continued discussions will result in a viable proposal from IR4 about the technical details needed for field trials and for sampling hemp plants. So I think we're in a very good position to move forward with IR4. I, I thank you for that, and I wish you uh, uh, the very best. Dr. Abernathy, well, there are significant questions that I have regarding the issues you've outlined in front of the FDA at this time. I promised Chairman Alexander that I would stay in my lane or our lane uh, during this hearing. Instead, I will address those issues whenever appropriate in the health committee. I'm on that committee as well. However, I am wondering about the need for data regarding approval for HAP as animal feed. Does this data and needed information exist? Thank you. Uh, indeed, we do need data around animal feed. Importantly, now that hemp is, has been removed from the Controlled Substances Act, we will have the ability to study cannabidiol and hemp better and understand the impact on animals. With respect to animals and animal feed, we need to understand the impact of hemp and cannabidiol on animals, 
on food producing animals that ultimately have an impact on human health. And then also given the fact that anim animals typically eat the same feed every single day, the issue of continuous exposure and potentially accumulation. So there's a safety question there as well. Critically, we understand as FDA that we need to get the data, but we need to be very focused in the data that is ultimately sought after so that we do not unduly take extra time or extra resources to get to the answers that American farmers and the American public needs. I appreciate that. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Chair Roberts, and welcome to all of you to this committee today. I'm so happy to have this conversation. You know, just earlier this week, the banking committee where I serve um, talked about the banking challenges facing the cannabis industry. And I'm also a member of that committee, so I raise an issue that has um, I've been hearing a lot about from Minnesota farmers. Um, they've told me that they, it is tough to get loans or even access to payment processing for hemp because farmers haven't received the guidance that they need from the USDA. And so I'm really happy to see representatives from all of your agencies um, on this panel, USDA and EPA and also FDA. So in order to, as Chair Roberts says, have a farmer-friendly process here and to be able to support farmers and not hinder them um, as they want to start growing hemp, um, it's going to take cooperation across the federal government, um, DEA, Department of Transportation, DOI, the Small Business Administration, Treasury, um, banking regulators. Um, all these federal agencies need to be aware of the regulation that USDA is making, um, as well as the research that comes out of the Agricultural Research Service. So my question to all of you is this. When it comes to hemp, is there a formal dialogue that is taking place across all of the federal agencies, and how are you collaborating exactly um, when it comes to supporting our farmers on this issue? I might uh, offer my thoughts first, and then everybody else can offer theirs as well. Part of the interagency review process that we're going through right now with the uh, interim final rule at OMB is allowing for that discussion process to begin. It gives uh, all those uh, federal agencies the opportunity to look at the proposed interim final rule that uh, USDA has put forth. It uh, allows the, the opportunity to open a dialogue that uh, uh, goes into many of these subject areas and they can explore some of the questions about how their programs might be affected by our rule and then we can have that discussion to be able to put forward a, uh, an interim final rule that uh, not only works for farmers and ranchers but also uh, can work between the interagency cooperation that needs to take place as well. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Vaden. I would uh, add another important uh, partner uh, who is not here today but nonetheless is, is very important to this effort, particularly because Congress required us to coordinate with it, and that's the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been engaging in the statutorily required consultation with the Department of Justice at every level. I have been participating in those conversations as well as other colleagues from the Office of General Counsel, individuals from the Agriculture Marketing Service, and that's critical so that law enforcement, A, can be assured that we're running this program as Congress expects us to in a forthright and legal manner, and also so that law enforcement can have access to the information that Congress has asked us to provide so that they can be assured that the farmer, the field of hemp that was mentioned earlier that you drive by on the highway, is actually hemp by checking with a database that we will be required to maintain in coordination with the Department of Justice. And finally, I would note that they are providing input into the testing as well as they have a very important legal role to play should someone uh, wantonly break that point three limit. Thank you. Well, so Thank you, Senator, for your question. And with regard to the EPA, we are also engaged with our colleagues. Uh, particularly, uh, we have a unique dialogue with the FDA. Um, uh, we have to work with the FDA on jurisdictional issues associated with CBD products in food. Um, so when it comes to food safety, EPA will be working with our federal partners to ensure that the food supply is safe, and we will work with FDA as they look at CBD um, to inform our work. And then uh, we're not waiting on another federal agency necessarily, but we are actively working together. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, in addition to what we've just said, um, ultimately in my opening statement, as I highlighted, we see this as a critical issue, is working across government to start to solve the question of appropriate regulations around hemp and provide regulatory clarity so that we ultimately are able to provide farmers the predictability that they need. A few details about that from the perspective of the FDA. We're certainly working together with EPA, as you've just heard um, from Alexandra Dunn. We also work together in an accelerating pace with USDA, and we have multiple interactions um, at all levels of FDA. We also are working together with states, and we had state governments represented in our full day meeting on May 31st, um, and there was a specific section where we heard what the state government needs were, and, and we're considering about how do we make sure we accelerate the pace of our communication. We see that this is a critical issue across all this work. I appreciate very much you uh, devoting uh, time to this, because um, I think sometimes Minnesota farmers feel a little bit like they're caught between a rock and a hard place, and they are feeling a real urgency to move forward, because given the current state of the farm economy in Minnesota and around the country with um, you know, trade disputes, low prices, and terrible weather, they're ready for, uh, they're, 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 they're looking for new opportunities. And so uh, th there's a lot of urgency on their part. I'm sure that you appreciate this. And so your cross-agency collaboration is, is just um, really important. And let me just ask one last question to um, uh, Undersecretary Eibach and uh, Mr. Vaden. Once the rules and regulations are out, around, this is a question around the right hemp seeds to use. Once those um, rules and regulations are out, how long will it take the ARS to set up a hemp research program, do you think? So actually prior to uh, 2018, uh, with the hemp being a controlled uh, a Schedule One drug, uh, ARS has uh, engaged in very little research at this point. Uh, ARS has now started to take t uh, steps to get a research be beginning on hemp. ARS has authorized the Geneva New York Laboratory uh, location or to devote funds to establishing an infrastructure to support studies done in conjunction with Cornell University. Um, this research uh, will take a look at destructive diseases, pests, weather extremes, as they relate to hemp production. And ARS is also exploring options to expand this research in conjunction with the 14 Farm Bill and is awaiting the AMS rule to guide development of additional projects. In addition to what ARS is doing, there are a number of state universities that have participated in the 2014 Farm Bill research opportunities. And we look forward to uh, being able to uh, gather those different research projects and see what type of applications they have. Uh, you know, because there are many different growing environments across the United States, some of those research projects are going to be very specific to those states and their, their individual growing regions, but some of them may have some great application across the entire United States. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, agree with Senator Smith. There couldn't be a better time for farmers in general, still uh, as actively involved in farming as they can be and still doing this job. Uh, we need to find new markets, new things to uh, compete with, I think, soybean and corn usage. Um, can you give me a, an idea, Mr. Eibach, uh, how big the hemp market is? I think, from my information, more than 30 countries produce hemp. It's got 22,000 different uses uh, from textile shoes, food, paper, rope, bioplastics, biofuel. Just generally speaking, how does this compare to soybeans and corn in terms of the potential market out there so farmers can actually have something that they could scale into something as big as their corn and soybean enterprises? Uh, there's probably more around the hemp industry right now than there is corn and soybeans. But uh, maybe just to share a little bit of data from 2018, 41 states have passed legislation and hemp is being grown in 23 of those in, uh, in the 2018 crop year. Uh, there were uh, uh, 3,546 state licenses issued 
and hemp was growing on about 78,000 acres. So again, that pales in comparison to corn and soybean numbers. Uh, but some states have uh, quite a bit of acreage uh, dedicated to that. Montana and Colorado have over 20,000 acres in each of those states, so that shows that there is a number of producers that have embraced it there. You know, I think one of the uh, concerns that we have at USDA is uh, with the excitement and the number of acres that are moving to hemp production and will be uh, planted to hemp in the 2019 crop year, that uh, we want to make sure that producers are aware and have an outlook outlet for their product, some place to sell it. And so we have encouraged pro uh, producers all uh, this spring to look for a partner, look for a customer, uh, encourage them to engage in a contract before producing hemp. One of our big concerns is that production and consumption or, or uh, processing won't uh, won't align with each other, and so that's one caution that we have uh, made to farmers as we've moved forward uh, with with our rule. So, do, is there a rough um, globally soybeans, corn, hemp? Can you give me any indication of what that would be, say, split percentage wise? I wouldn't be able to. It'd be interesting to know that because I think that'd be helpful for farmers. And then when you talk about lining up production with customers, what does it look like currently in the U.S.? Uh, I can't imagine many processors have been gung ho due to economy of scale. Um, so will you potentially have to export your product to a processor in another country? Do you think that's uh, you know, because it's a lot of infrastructure looks like it would have to get put in place before you can actually start to scale hemp production. So uh, maybe in the first part of your question, there's been more interest in the processing uh, facilities that have focused on CBD. And uh, so we see more of that in states across the United States. The fiber part of it has been slower to develop a, a processing industry. So for those producers that are interested in fiber production, uh, there's probably less alternatives right now for, in the processing. The export uh, opportunities also have um, some uh, um, concerns surrounding them is uh, whether or not there are international treaties that may uh, come into play as uh, exports uh, to that would hinder the exportability of of hemp products for processing, and so uh, you know we will need to work with USTR, the State Department, as well to help producers understand what kind of restrictions might be in place on the export side of things. And then currently, if somebody was looking at it for the fiber component, which looks like it's many of those twenty two thousand different uses, um, would you have? Can you import hemp? since it couldn't be legally produced here until just recently? Uh, or was it something where, since you couldn't get uh, source it domestically, that we basically have no industry in place? Uh, I think that the industry for fiber usage, there's been a lot of uh, pilot projects, a lot of uh, little research projects that have gone on. Uh, in uh, universities across the United States that have... Uh, have identified some possible uses. I also know that uh, in some states they have a more vigorous uh, developing industry, some research parks and uh, industrial parks that are focusing on hemp and hemp processing, especially on the fiber side, but very much developing. I think the, the imports of hemp into the United States, we made provisions earlier this year to be able to bring seed in. APHIS uh, put forward the regulatory process to be able to bring seed in from other countries, uh, but I don't think there's much attention been given to fiber. One final question. Is there any data on what the profit per acre would be from hemp uh, versus soybeans or corn? I think that is uh, very variable depending on whether the hemp is for seed for, for flour and food use, whether it's for CBD oil, or whether it would be for fiber. One of the reasons why, uh, and as far as 
being able to track the market value of those crops, we really don't have good information there either. That's one of the reasons why for the whole farm crop insurance, uh, RMA has, uh, dis uh, has put the requirement that producers have a contract so that it would indicate to us what the value of their crop. Thank you. Well, thank you to the first panel. I appreciate your testimony. A, a very good testimony. Thank you. I'd like to welcome our second panel of witnesses before the committee. So hearing from the FDA, the EPA, uh, and uh, agri uh, what you, uh, USDA, um, FDA just sent a letter to Cureleaf, a giant cannabis company, shot across the bow of the CBD industry, naming all of their health claims of products, CBD products on their website, social media as well, and uh, Cureleaf is no slouch. Um, so the FDA, is they are in control of CBD now, and they are making it known. And they're, yeah, rules, come on. There are rules. There are rules already. You can, you're just dragging your feet. This is all nonsense. There's plenty of science out there. The liver thing, we debunked that last week. Watch my video uh, uh, going over this Project CBD article that just debunks this liver toxicity nonsense. Of course, you're going to isolate a molecule and concentrate it. That's where you will get into trouble. <laughs> full, full spectrum, baby. Full flower oil. But uh, even in huge, huge concentrations, the effect to humans is not what they're saying it is. They killed apparently four and a half rats, and uh, that's what they're, why they're saying it's bad for humans. Turns out they tried to kill human-like animals, recessed monkeys, with pure THC. They gave them 1% of their body weight. They still couldn't kill them. With up to 1% of their body weight of pure THC oil, they couldn't kill the monkeys. <laughs> So that's closer to, the, to humans than rats, quite frankly. But um, I think we might have a good uh, rat poison, a, a, a harmless to humans rat poison. Uh, but yeah, the liver, not, read that article over at Project CBD. Is CBD toxic to the liver? And you will understand the junk science that's behind all of that hubbub, all of that nonsense and propaganda that's been grabbed onto. And uh, so we're waiting for our second panel here at the uh, Agricultural Committee, full committee hearing. We heard from uh, Mitch McConnell. Mitch is all in. He's all in on hemp. Hemp has been around for a while now. I think it's good. And this nonsense that what, what, what do we, we need rules. We need, we've been eating and consuming and using imported hemp products forever. Hemp seed, hemp oil. You can find all of that stuff. Here they go. Oh, are they? Are they seated yet? They're milling about. Milling about. Uh, votes going on. I'm not sure what this panel is. Let's take a look. Let's see what this panel is. This panel. Our first witness on the oh, second panel is Mr. Brian Furnish. Uh, Leader McConnell is planning to introduce Mr. Furnish and did. Uh, and did so very well. He is here with his... Uh, daughter, um, Cindy, right? Gracie. Gracie. Sorry to call you Cindy, Gracie. Um, I think it bears repeating. He is an eighth-generation farmer from Cynthiana, Kentucky. Who is Cynthia? Uh, Colonel Harrison in the Civil War. Had two daughters, one named Cynthia and one named Anna. So they named the county Harrison and the city Cynthiana. Well, there you go. <laughs> I had to ask. Uh, Brian uh, grows hemp, tobacco, corn, raises beef cows, founder of Gen 8 Farms LLC, former president and board member of the United States Hemp Roundtable. He is accomplished by his daughter, Gracie. Welcome. And then our next uh, panelist is Mrs. Erica Stark the executive director of the National Hemp Association from Reading, Pennsylvania. Mrs. Stark is the executive director of the National Hemp Association, which represents farmers as well as processors, manufacturers in the hemp industry. Mrs. Stark was also involved in the industrial hemp program in Pennsylvania and has helped farmers manage hemp, 
hemp permits grown there since 2017. She is accompanied by the Association, Association's Board Chairman, Jeff Whaling, and her husband, Les Tark. So we welcome you, and I turn down to uh, Senator Smith to introduce her next witness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. It's my honor to introduce uh, Chair Daryl Seeke of the Red Lake Nation. Uh, welcome, my friend, to Washington. Uh, Chair Seeke was raised uh, by his grandparents. He was born in Red Lake, Minnesota, and has spent the majority of his life in the village of Panema on the Red Lake uh, Nation. Chair Seeke is a proud veteran, having served in the Vietnam era. Uh, Chair Siki has served the Red Lake Nation in various capacities over 40 years and is one of the longest serving members of the Department of the Interior Tribal Budget Council, having represented the Midwest region for 16 years. Chair Siki has been a leader in the Native Farm Bill Coalition, which influenced uh, many of the provisions in the Farm Bill last year that helped Native farmers. Uh, Red Lake Nation has for many years operated the Red Lake Tribal Farms and the Red Lake Nation Foods. The Red Lake Nation has actively marketed native food products like wild rice in national and international markets. Chair Siki was elected council treasurer in 2002 and served in that position until his election to chairman in 2014, and he was re-elected in 2018. I want to just also note, Mr. Chair, that the 23rd annual Anishinaabe Spirit Run starts next week. And the Spirit Run is an intertribal community event co-sponsored by Red Lake. And this is a 200-mile relay in northern Minnesota that uh, travels through three tribal nations and promotes wellness and balance in mind, body, and spirit. So I'm very happy to welcome Chair Siki to this committee this morning. Uh, we thank you, Senator Smith. Brian, why don't you start off? Thank you, Chairman Roberts and members of the committee. I appreciate you having me here for this important testimony and important crop that's affecting many Kentucky farmers and many farmers throughout the nation. My name is Brian Furnish, and I'm an eighth generation tobacco farmer. In the past seven years, I've helped change hemp laws in Kentucky and in Washington. I was the first licensed hemp grower in the United States since World War II. I was with you and went when Mr. President signed the 2018 Farm Bill in the White House. I first started working with the political process with Senator Mitch McConnell back in 1999 when we first worked on the tobacco buyout that was finally accomplished in 2004. I was general manager of the Burley Tobacco Growers Cooperative in Lexington, Kentucky and traveled to over 70 countries selling tobacco and I realized that American tobacco farmers needed an alternative crop to tobacco. Congressman Jamie Comer, who was the, then the Commissioner of Agriculture in Kentucky, asked me to help make this crop legal in 2012. That's when I started to work with Senator McConnell and you all to make hemp legal in the United States. The 2014 Farm Bill made hemp legal in states and had a law that allowed research with the universities. At that time, I received the first grower license under the 2014 Farm Bill. I then proceeded to try to find a partner in the hemp business. I found an Australian man that was growing and researching hemp in Australia for 18 years. Now that company has a worldwide presence and has a market cap of over $1 billion on the stock exchange in Australia, and they were just listed the 1st of April. I was the first citizen chairman of the Kentucky Hemp Commission and a founder and first president of the U.S. Hemp Roundtable, the industry-leading national business, business advocacy organization that now has 80 members and serves as a leading advocate in the industry effort to make hemp legal. My brothers and I have grown all three types of hemp for seed, for fiber, and for CBD production. To Each of these hemp categories uses a different genetics and different growing methods and different planting times throughout the season. For the fiber, we plant about 50 pounds of seed per acre and we want to grow hemp as tall as we possibly can. My first hemp crop got to over 23 feet tall and I uh, yielded four tons per acre. The average value of a ton of hemp fiber at this time is $185 a ton. For seed, we plant approximately 30 pounds per acre, hoping to get a yield of 800 to 1,000 pounds per acre, and currently we sell that for 85 cents a pound. For CBD production and uh, full-spectrum hemp oil production, we set about 3,200 plants per acre, and we plant it the same way we've always planted tobacco for eight generations one small plant at a time with manual labor. We harvest the CBD by only using the flower buds and the leaves. 
You want to short hemp for CBD because it is harvested by hand or special machines like tobacco, and it's very labor intensive. So we do not want that plant very tall. For the seed plants, uh, we want those plants to be between four and five feet tall so we can combine them with a regular combine and a draper head on the front of a combine. The new hemp industry needs a lot of genetic research to make each of these uses profitable. As with most plants, the latitude must be consistent to get consistent production. In Kentucky, we learned early on that Canadian seed varieties do not do very well in Kentucky. Our days and nights are too different from theirs, and so we have to find genetics for the right latitude. And normally, bringing southern genetics north works much better than taking northern genetics south. Hemp seed for feminized seed needs certain periods of light and dark, so we need dark rooms for our genetic grow rooms for creating feminized seed for full spectrum and CBD production, not greenhouses because they offer too much light at the wrong time of the year. We have learned a lot over the last five years about the hemp industry, and it has a long way to go before it's mainstream production agriculture. Having a certified seed program for hemp would be a huge benefit to hemp farmers, and I discussed this yesterday with members of the USDA staff of how critical it is for farmers to have access to certified seed. Now that hemp is legal, we need to take a close look and remove one by one the barriers to success so that hemp can be on the same production playing field as all other crops. Most folks in the government, even in production agriculture, probably don't know or realize that hemp has no legal pesticides or herbicides or fungicides. A grower can lose its entire crop to weeds or pests. Without an approved herbicide or pesticide, we may have to pay a labor bill of $500 to $2,500 an acre just to get the weeds out of our hemp crop to make sure that it's still a pure crop when we harvest it. We need your help to encourage the EPA and USDA to make these approvals happen as soon as possible. Hemp growers also have no USDA RMA crop insurance at this time. While I know and am a part of a U.S. Hemp Farming Alliance, a group involved in the efforts to make that happen, we need to keep the pressure on for the creation of those necessary risk management tools and make them ready available to farmers as soon as possible. Also, without hemp processors knowing if FDA will make hemp a food or a dietary supplement, the, only un the unknown only un complicates the downstream use of hemp. The current contracts for hemp growers are all over the place. Many times the grower provides the land and the labor and the processors provide the seed and the genetics and the expertise. By the way, there's no expert in the hemp business because they don't exist. However, too often the growers are shortchanged when the processor can't come up with the money to pay the growers. Or the specification for the final project has uh, such varied results that both sides feel cheated and it's a bad experience for all involved. In closing, myself have been, for better or worse, a farmer face for the hemp grower in an effort to finally make it a legal crop here in the United States. I thank you for making this wonderful crop legal, but now what the hemp growers need and want is for this new and valuable crop to be just that, a crop, with the same opportunities to grow and fill the marketplace with new and valued products. Corn, wheat, and soybeans all have hundreds and maybe thousands of product uses. Hemp can too but they need the barriers removed and the consistency and stabilization which come from the regulatory framework you all can give us. On behalf of the hemp farmers, my family, and growers all over the nation, I'm asking for your help. Thank you for your time and consideration, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Ryan, we really appreciate your comments. Uh, Mrs. Tark, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman Roberts and the entire committee and staff for affording us this opportunity to speak on the implementation of the 2018 Farm Bill. The National Hemp Association is a nonprofit grassroots organization supporting tens of thousands of farmers, businesses, and consumers. We have a particular interest in ensuring that this opportunity benefits small and medium sized farmers who have been struggling and who form the backbone of America's rural and agricultural economies and is the foundation upon which this country's hemp industry is being built. Reasonable regulation will be instrumental in ensuring future success. One of the major components of these pending regulations is the testing protocol used for THC compliance. The language of the Farm Bill defines hemp as the plant cannabis sativa L and any part of that plant with a delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol concentration of not more than 0.3% on a dry weight basis. 
When the Farm Bill addresses the requirements for state and tribal plans, it indicates that there must be a provision for testing using post-decarboxylation or other similarly reliable methods. This language raises many questions and concerns and changes the way many states were testing under their 2014 pilot programs. One of the challenges the pilot programs revealed and what we hope to prevent moving forward is that if states implement too many different testing protocols, we are left in a situation where what is legal in one state may be considered illegal in another state. That can create undue hardship for farmers selling across state lines, for trucking companies, for law enforcement, and for consumers. Another of the challenges revealed by the 2014 pilot programs relates to the uncertainty of determining Delta 9 THC in hemp crops, including using post-decarboxylation or other similarly reliable methods. We would like to recommend an approach that creates a level playing field across the country while adhering to the law and providing the best possible protection for farmers and consumers. This can be accomplished by specifies using uh, gas chromatography flame ionization detection or high performance liquid chromatography to estimate the delta 9 THC levels in post decarboxylated hemp. And that that estimate resulting from those decarboxylation methods be divided by three in order to determine the delta 9 THC. The reason for dividing the test results by three is due to the relative difference in the concentrations of THC in post-decarboxylated hemp as compared to the concentrations in hemp on a dry weight basis. Peer-reviewed research demonstrates that the ratio of THC in post-decarboxylated hemp to the THC in hemp on a dry weight basis is somewhere between 3 to 1 and 11 to 1. So our recommendation to divide the post-decarboxylated test results by three is the most conservative end of that range to assure that a crop will meet the legal requirement of 0.3% <coughs> THC on a dry weight basis. It also closes any loopholes that could even potentially allow marijuana to be introduced into the marketplace. We further recommend that there be standards established for calibration methods, sample preparation, and control samples. What must be kept top of mind is that this is about the farmers, all of which want to stay compliant. And we are talking about one-tenth of one percent being the difference between a farmer making a profit or suffering a devastating loss. The simple fact is there is no single or absolute way to determine those THC levels with that level of precision. Our recommendation provides compliance to the legal definition of hemp, satisfies the requirement for post-decarboxylation testing, while also providing protection to farmers and the public. This is a difficult topic to cover in five minutes, so more details on the testing protocols along with other important issues such as sampling, personal el eligibility requirements, cross-pollination, hemp flour, and importation of biomass are included in our written testimony. To quote our chairman, Jeff Whaling, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and we need to get this right. We acknowledge that implementation of the hemp provisions of the 2018 Farm Bill is a challenging task for regulators because it touches so many different federal and state agencies, farmers, businesses, and the public. At the very heart of what we need to move forward is simplicity and clarity. We need regulations that create an even playing field across the country. We need to eliminate the unintended consequences of legal gray areas caused by each state testing differently and operating under a different set of rules and regulations. The hemp industry has been struggling with legal uncertainties for far too long and looks forward to reasonable regulations which will afford the opportunity for all to prosper within a clear legal framework. Thank you again for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, we thank you for an excellent statement, Mrs. Stark. Uh, Chairman Saki, from one chairman to another, please. Chairman Roberts, Ranking Member Stabino, my tribe, Senator Smith, and other friends on this committee, my name is Daryl G. Siki Sr. I am chairman of the Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians. 
to migrate for the opportunity to testify today about the opportunities and challenges that the new federal hemp law offers for Indian country. Red Lake's 840,000 acre reservation is held in trust for my tribe by the United States and is home to over 12,000 tribal members. It's remote with limited job opportunities while unemployment in Minnesota is below 3%. Our Ours remains close to 40%. Because of this, our Red Lake tribal government is constantly trying to create new jobs on our reservation. Thanks to this committee and thanks to the work of many tribes and organizations in the Native Farm Bill Coalition, the 2018 Farm Bill opened the door for tribal governments to create new and sustainable opportunities for jobs and economic developments by growing, processing, marketing hemp products. Several years ago, our Red Lake tribal government began to develop necessary legal logistics infrastructure to grow, process, and market hemp products. We set aside lands for hemp farming, developed tribal law to guide the development of our regulatory plans. We issued a license to a tribal member who made plans for a joint venture project with an experienced hemp grower. And we also explored our agreements with seed providers from Manitoba and Colorado. We also sought the significant levels of financial capital investment that are needed to turn our reservation into a competitive, productive growing processing center for industrial, industrial hemp in our region. Red Lake, like some other reservation, is a great platform where large-scale growing and regional processing can take place in a business-friendly climate. We are excited by the possibilities. However, our enthusiasm has been tempered by the significantly large startup costs of land preparation, seeds, cultivation, and testing equipment. These challenges are compounded by the regulatory uncertainty that tribes are experienced at the hands of the USDA. All our efforts are at risk of being wasted if USDA doesn't give tribes like Red Lake a fair regulatory opportunity to compete on an equal footing with states. Earlier this year, USDA announced that it was developing a 2018 Farm Bill regulations on hemp which were in initially expected to be re released in early fall of 2019 to accommodate the 2020 growing season. Yes, USDA continues to push back its release date. That means tribal producers are getting less and less time to prepare, plan, finance, and plan for the new crop year. Meanwhile, states are forging ahead in the competition because they have 2014 Farm Bill Authority on Hemp Seed cultivation processing that tribes do not because tribes were shut out of the 2014 Farm Bill hemp provisions. It is ridiculous and naive for USDA to suggest that tribes should ask states if they would partner with us as a highly competitive stage of emerging mar market. Although Congress unlocked the door to tribal hemp production, USDA is jamming, jamming that door shut through delays that put tribe at competitive disadvantages. I doubt is what Congress intended. Because of this, Red Lake is urging this committee to work with Indian country to compel USDA to take five actions right away. First, USDA must negotiate with tribes to determine co what constitutes the territory of a tribal government that will define boundaries of each tribe's jurisdiction over hemp production. Second, USDA must partner with tribal governments through direct consultation to develop a model plan for hemp that each tribe can adapt to to fit its own situation. Third, USDA must guarantee tribes equal access to credit, crop insurance, technical assistance for hemp production and processing. Fourth, USDA must recruit FDA and together work jointly with tribal governments in approving and marketing hemp products. Fifth and finally, USDA must issue its 2018 Farm Bill regulations early fall after robust negotiations with tribes so that tribes are no longer disadvantaged by being left out of the 2014 authority. And Chimigwich for inviting me to testify today for your leadership in acting the 28th Farm Bill. Red Lake 
nation looks forward to working with you to see that the law is implemented as you intended and um, be available for questions or, and I'll say again, Chimigwich. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rest assured, when the USDA has its final rule ready, and we're going to, we don't want to hurry this up too much, but we want to get it right. But we know we have to expedite this, and that uh, a language with regards to your, your concerns that you have outlined will be addressed. Um, Mr. Furnish, your experience as a grower with more than one business model for hemp production on your operation brings a viable perspective. Do you have any suggestions regarding how the RMA can determine good farming practices when hemp varieties are changing and producers are learning more about the crop every year, such as best planting dates and crop rotations? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I think it would be very beneficial if members of all agencies come to a working hemp farm in Kentucky and get to experience all the different scenarios that play out on our farm. I would also encourage the uh, different uh, agencies to get in touch with the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, Commissioner Ryan Quarles, and Doris Hamilton, who is the hemp director, and ask them how they managed and uh, accelerated the Kentucky program from 33 acres in 2014 to 60,000 acres in 2019. And so the groundwork has been laid in Kentucky. We have a tremendous amount of, amount of data available through the Kentucky Department of Agriculture and through our hemp growing program. So I would encourage anybody that wants to learn about hemp and what's happened in the last, uh, six, this is my sixth crop. All the data has been kept by the Department of Agriculture, Commissioner Ryan Quarles, and it's all available to agencies to take a look at. There's data on production, there's data on profitability, there's data on how many crops have been destroyed because of weeds, there's data on how many crops have been planted that were not harvested. So there's tons of data available in Kentucky if people will just ask us for it. And any agency or any member of this committee is invited to my farm at any time to have the experience of what we're dealing with in the hemp industry, as well as to see the processing side. Uh, we built a processing facility from the ground up uh, went from a shed in the side of a barn into a $35 million facility to process hemp and ship it all over the world on our farm in Cynthiana, Kentucky. So it's quite an experience, and if anybody wants to come or, or if you want to hold a field hearing at my farm, that would be most welcome, Chairman. With that, um, you have discussed the need for an effective herbicide. Can you uh, tell the committee about the agri pardon me, agronomic challenges for hemp growers in the absence of any crop protection tools? Mr. Chairman, I would say the first couple years in Kentucky that 80 to, 80 to 90 percent of the acres planted were destroyed by weeds at, at planting. The challenge with hemp seed is, is when you plant it directly into a field, the seed is not very vigorous and it's very hard to get out of the ground. So the soil conditions and the rain has to be almost perfect to get the current hemp varieties to germinate in the field. I've planted one hemp field seven times one summer just to try to get it to live. It was either too dry or too wet, or it rained the day I planted it. It was too crusted. It was too deep. It was too shallow. And so we have perfected that. Over six crops, we've per perfected that. But it's still a challenge. And so um, weeds are a very big problem um, in all other commodities, I have weed killers available that I can put on pre-plant or even post-plant. Right now, we go to extensive lengths to make sure that weeds do not get in our crop. The reason we went to the tobacco model of planting the crop is because we have weed control systems already set up with cultivation equipment from tobacco, and so we're able to keep the weeds out of the hemp the same way we can the tobacco with cultivation. But it would be much easier if I could, when I put my fertilizer on pre-plant, that I could come through with a herbicide that, that has a effect over the entire length of the crop, the same way we do for any other crop. So many farmers lost all their money the first year due to weeds. Luckily on our farm, we've planted about a thousand acres and only destroyed five. So that's a pretty good track record for a new crop. But I was lucky enough to have a gentleman from Australia who had 18 years of experience even though we have different growing models, he was able to bring his experience to me, and we were able to perfect that experience in Kentucky. I appreciate that very much. What part of your hemp crop is 23 feet high? The fiber crop is planted um, 
to get as tall as possible. So we planted in May, and we hope by August it's 22 to 23 feet tall. And we had to buy specialized equipment from Germany and Australia just to mow it because it was so big. But once we mow it with this mower from Germany, um, we can actually handle it very easily at that point because it cuts it into two-foot section, lays it on the ground in a windrow, and then we can bail it or chop it. And so it's very easy at that point. But many farmers have tried to use hay equipment to bail fiber, and it's an absolute disaster. I thank you for your testimony and very practical advice. Mrs. Stark, uh, your testimony regarding sampling and testing is extremely insightful. What is the most important issue on testing affecting farmers and the interstate movement of the crop hemp? The largest issue there is, is consistency that, that what tests legal in one state will also test legal using the same or a different method in another state. And that's why we make the re recommendation of reconciling the difference between decarboxylation testing and testing on a dry weight basis. That ensures that just a little bit of, of wiggle room, to, so to speak, in order to make sure that no matter which protocol a state's using for testing or what law enforcement is using to test for compliance will be consistent from state to state. So there's no risk of a consumer purchasing a product in another state and bringing it home and having it, it test uncompliant in that state. Um, like I said, the, when you're talking about one-tenth of one percent being the difference between legal and illegal, um, it's important. Um, I, I think that the spirit of the language of, in the Farm Bill of mandating post-decarboxylation testing is to close any potential loophole that could let marijuana escape into the market under the guise of the hemp program. Um, but, but certainly even with a few points over 0.3 post decarboxylation, there is zero risk of, of that happening um, with, with our recommended protocols. Ms. Stark, finally, um, I should have started with the most basic question. Does your association support implementation of the rule of the Department of Agriculture in a farmer-friendly manner? Obviously, you do, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> with availability of an option for crop protection to help this industry expand without or with any future expansion? Certainly. I mean, you know, certainly we are very, very supportive of organic practices for hemp. And one of the things that is attractive about hemp to a lot of, like, smaller farmers is its um, uh, propensity to do well in organic practices. But we have not done this yet on a full commercial scale. And when we start seeing thousands, if not millions, of acres of hemp being grown, particularly for fiber production for manufacturing purposes, Absolutely, I anticipate that that's going to be an important issue. Um, I, I think there, from some of the researchers I've talked to, we just don't know what pests are going to become problematic. It, it seems like um, once hemp is starts to be grown right next to other more traditional crops, it could be that certain pests that are a problem in those like rye or wheat crops might figure out that they have a, a taste for hemp as well. So certainly the research should be done now in anticipation of, of moving forward to make sure that it doesn't ever become extremely problematic. So there is definitely a need for that and definitely a need for the specific testing protocols for food products uh, because hemp does tend to be a hyper accumulator and absorb more um, toxins than, than traditional plants, but it's definitely going to be a, a large need. I appreciate that very much. Senator Smith. Thank you, Chair Roberts, and thanks to all of you for being here today. Um, Chair Siki, I'd like to start with you. I very much appreciate your testimony, and I appreciate Chair Roberts' comments also that we hear you loud and clear on how important it is that USDA do the kind of consultation with uh, tribal governments just as they would with state governments or other, other governments. And, um, you know, I want to uh, say that, um, you know, if, for those of you who don't know Minnesota so well, the Red Lake Nation is over 260 miles from um, Minneapolis and St. Paul. And um, as you say, because of the remoteness, unemployment is a significant issue. And I remember when I first met you in 2014, uh, we talked about many things, but your 
particular passion was economic development on, um, you know, in Red Lake Nation and what we could do. So I appreciate how important this opportunity could be for Red Lake. Um, let me ask you, Chair Siki, you in your in your testimony, you talked about the idea. You know, we talked about various ways that USDA could consult with and assist tribal governments as they pursue this opportunity. And you talked about the idea of maybe a, if USDA could create a model plan for. Um, for tribal governments. Um, could you talk about that and just expand a little bit more on how uh, we could be better partners um, with the tribes as they work forward this opportunity? Okay, before I start uh, the first panel, it's concerning to me, to us, that only USDA mentioned tribes. See, this is the problem I see, we see, is because we were not included in the 2014 Farm Bill. But now that we are included in the 2018 Farm Bill, and there are many obstacles that the tribes are running into, and that a model for all tribes that everyone works together as partnership to make this, this hemp production work in Indian country is a number very, very important. Because you, as your committee, as I stated in my oral statement, I gave you five, recommended five mm -hmm. steps to be, to be done to work for our tr tribal nations so we can do this the right way and the model for, for the other tribes that are interested in doing hemp production. Thank you very much, Chair Siki, and it's a great point. It's not only USDA, it's all of the federal agencies that interact, and so we'll follow up specifically to make sure that we, we address this. Um, let me ask. Um, let me ask, Mr. Furnish. I'm so interested in the um, all of the um, practical experience that you have and that we have in Kentucky, and um, I under appreciate that there's still a lot of research that we have left to do on the best varieties of hemp seed, what's most suitable for different growing reasons. And you talked about this in your testimony. Um, could as a as a seasoned hemp grower, could you? Give, what advice would you have to give um, to new hemp growers about ensuring that the hemp crop is at the 0.3% THC when the plant is harvested? Um, Senator, it all starts with the genetics. You have to find a reputable genetic source who will tell you the truth and tell you what the actual C of A's are, which is a certificate of analysis. And you have to try to find one that's as close to being certified as possible. And the problem is there's very few reputable seed source farms available in the United States at this point. Most of the varieties for CBD production and for full-spectrum hemp oil production came from bad marijuana varieties. And so that's what we're dealing with. And so many farmers are buying genetics from, from suppliers who are told in the beginning that the only way to keep it below 0.3 is to harvest it early. Well, that creates a huge problem because then your cannabinoid content is also less because you harvested it early. Mm -hmm. So my brothers and I have been trying to come up with varieties that we do not have to harvest early and that we can let go to full maturity but still below, stay below 0.3. And we've had pretty good success at that. I would encourage any farmer that wants to start in this industry is first talk to somebody who's done it for a while. Don't believe people who say they're experts. And don't believe a company who comes and says that I'm going to provide everything. You just provide your land and labor, and I'm going to give you hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. because that's not reality. And um, the reality is you can make a living growing hemp, but you will not become rich growing hemp in one year. And many farmers are being told by companies, if you grow hemp for me and grow my genetics, you're going to be rich in a year. And I don't know anything legal in the United States that you can become <laughs> rich in a year. And so I would encourage anybody, you know, come to Kentucky. We have field days. University of Kentucky has field days. Murray State is doing great work on hemp. They have a field day. Um, we'll, we'll do farm tours for farmers. Um, I don't have enough time on my schedule to answer every farmer that calls me, but I try to do a good job of working with other state, federal, and regional organizations to get the word out about what hemp is. And I would encourage anybody here or listening to this to join the U.S. Hemp Roundtable as a supporter. Um, it's very effective. We've helped change a lot of laws throughout the country. There's a lot of useful information that's generated on a daily basis to members of that group. 
And that's a good networking opportunity for everybody in the industry. Um, political figures, government officials, farmers, producers, researchers. It's, it's a hub that everybody ought to be using. There's other organizations, the Vote Hemp, National Hemp Association. Um, there's many organizations out there. I'm just familiar with the U.S. Hemp Roundtable because I was a founding member and president, but that's not the only one. Mm -hmm. um, join these organizations. Go to these trade shows and conferences, but enter hemp with caution, extreme caution. I know multi-million dollars lost every day in the hemp business in Kentucky and across the United States. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. No, thank you. The, uh, that was, again, very interesting. This is a uh, topic of discussion right now. And uh, Mr. Furnish, you're kind of one of the guinea pigs. You've been in this for, for quite a while compared to most. Uh, it sounds like, you know, if you can't, uh, don't have time for all the calls, at some point when you get tired of working the fields, you can become a hemp consultant you know there's I, probably I, money to be made in that regard i already ha already am a hemp consultant <laughs> sir very it, good it pays better than farming exactly uh i'd like to talk a little bit about some of the nuts and bolts as far as getting in the business i used to have a bunch of cows understand that business very well and then you know i've grown to understand all of these things but uh tell us about the expense of getting in is it uh is it costly to do that or it, All of farming is costly these days. but Yes, sir, Senator. I think it uh, depends on what part of the country you're in as to what type of hemp you will grow. Um, it's my belief that the, cadabida, the CBD full-spectrum hemp oil production will take place where tobacco and vegetables have been grown because the farmers are used to having labor-intensive crops with a lot of machinery and they're used to farming that away. Now, I will never be good at growing uh, fiber and uh, seed from hemp because I'm not in a row crop area and I don't have large acreage that I can run huge machines across. So it's my belief that the seed production and the fiber production will take place in the corn belt where you have flatter land and you, need, and you don't need as much water to grow hemp. So I anticipate in the future that's where those crops will go. For a tobacco farmer, getting into hemp production is very simple. We didn't have to spend any money to start growing hemp on our farm. But we own a lot of equipment a lot of tobacco equipment, a lot of wagons, a lot of tobacco barns. We, we use uh, one acre of hemp requires 25 rails in a tobacco barn. That's how we do it. Okay. It's very efficient. It's very cheap. But we already had the assets in Kentucky that we needed to do this crop. And that's one reason I think Kentucky has done so well so far with the acreage is because we already had the infrastructure. Um, the biggest challenge we have is H-2A labor. Um, we will have 60 workers on our farm this year, and we're dealing with the H-2A, and it's almost a full-time job for one of my brothers just to keep the paperwork straight between the hemp regulation and the H-2A regulation. It's a, it's a full-time job. Mm -hmm. It should not be that complicated to bring in legal workers to work on our farm, considering they've been helping us for 18 years. Sure. We should not have to go through the same paperwork and the same housing inspections every single year. A three-year visa program through H-2A for workers who have never caused a problem would be excellent for us so we could do paperwork every three years instead of every year. Right. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's farming. We have a lot of challenges. Weather is a challenge. Um, but the biggest challenge right now is good genetics and companies buying from you that will tell you the truth and pay you on time and pay you what they're supposed to pay you. You mentioned about seed. So you're, it sounds like you're developing your own seed varieties. Um, is the seed, do most people sell the seed as a crop or yes, as part of the crop? Or Every scenario you can imagine is taking place in the country right now. You have a lot of experts who have done this their whole lives who just started three months ago who are trying to sell seed to farmers. Right. The biggest challenge farmers have right now for what's most uh, in demand is for CBD. So you need high CBD varieties and low THC varieties. The challenge is that seed is not available, so the majority of farmers in the United States are using clones from mother plants. Mm -hmm. Clones is a very expensive way to farm. It's not good for agriculture. It's good for greenhouse production, but it's not good for agriculture. Um, a clone right now delivered to my farm from a supplier in Kentucky or Colorado or California would cost me $4 a piece, 3 to, three to $4 a piece. 
Um, it requires us 3,200 3, plants per acre. So you take 3,200 times four, and I've already got $13,000 invested in plants, okay? That's not reality of farming moving forward, okay? The price of CBD will fall. It, once there's more production, the price will fall. So the only way for farmers to sustain that is to have a good source of seed. And we try to plant feminized seed because the male will pollinate the female and create seed in the female, which creates problems for the extraction. So we try to eliminate the males by using feminized seed. Well, if I buy feminized seed right now, I have to pay a dollar a dollar a seed to have it delivered to me. Odds are the germination will be 20 to 30 percent lower than the company says it is. And then when I plant it, it'll be 20 to 30 percent higher in the amount of males in the field than what they told me it is. So the only way to remedy that is to create with USDA a PVP program for seed certification and breeding of feminized seed through a true research partner and a farmer because we know what needs to take place and we move faster than government and universities. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to develop a project now to speed up this process with the help of the 2018 Farm Bill, now we can go after a PVP, which is plant varietal protection for genetics, which does not exist. People claim to own genetics in this country right now for hemp, and they make you sign a contract that says you cannot repropagate that variety. The truth is nobody owns the genetics. They have stolen the genetics from somebody else. Right. Thank you very much. Senator Hoven. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is this kind of an early takeover, or what's going on here today? <laughs> you well, you behind. Senator Hoven, I had a rapid rise to power here today. <laughs> uh, impressed. <laughs> uh, thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, Ms. Stark, uh, talk about the market size. I mean, uh, you know, I, I know there's a lot of interest in growing hemp and, and developing the market. Talk to me about the market size, the market potential for all of the different potential products that go with hemp, whether it's the CBD or uh, you know, making clothes or whatever it is. Just kind of take me through the market opportunities, market size, and scope. Um, well, certainly right now CBD is the the largest segment of the marketplace. It's it's where the the demand is right now. It's where the where the money is right now. Um, well, that's the, kind of important when you're deciding which <laughs> it is, but crop but, and product to go with, isn't it? But cultivation for CBD versus fiber and grain are, are two very different business models. Okay. They're cultivated differently. The genetics are different. The the input costs are dramatically different, and um, it they really are. It's the same plant, but it, it, it they almost are kind of different industries. So the, the infrastructure for processing CBD exists right now. It's where all the investment has been so far. So right now, CBD is, is definitely where the markets are. Now, the future of that is largely going to depend on how FDA handles this and what type of regulatory framework we right. have to move forward. Um, the longer-term vision for hemp in looking, you know, maybe five, ten years down the road, hopefully faster than that, would be the fiber markets. That's where we're going to have the opportunity to create manufacturing jobs and that have the need to grow hemp on a massive scale. When we talk about supplying the auto industry and um, looking to replace single-use plastics, replacing... Um, you know, some of the paper pulp we use for paper plates and for paper making and things of that nature. So it, it's, there's a lot of infrastructure that still needs to be built there, but the long-term potential of that is tremendous. I, I often say that I think that, that fiber is going to be the future of hemp. Um, it has the most potential. It's also going to be what... Um, is going to help us realize the most positive environmental impacts as well. Um, there, there's so much benefit to it, but we're still a little bit behind on building the infrastructure to get there, um, as opposed to CBD, which is very popular and in demand right now. And I expect it will continue to be for the foreseeable future, assuming that we get a clear regulatory framework. So is that it? Oil and fiber are the two... Are, are there other aspects of it? Well, there's the, the 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 word oil is confusing for a lot of people. Hemp oil 
is not CBD oil. Hemp oil, by strict definition, is cold pressed from the seed. And that type of oil is what's used to make cooking oil. It's a popular basis for soaps, lotions, and shampoos. But it's, and that has always been perfectly legal. That has always been exempted from the Controlled Substances Act from the beginning, which is why we have the market for hemp hearts and hemp soaps and lotions um, from oil that we've been always able to import from Canada or other places. CBD oil, on the other hand, is extracted from the plant material, primarily the flower. So I always like to use the analogy of thinking of it as like a lavender essential oil. It's just an extract from the cannabis plant, the hemp plant, as opposed to lavender or other types of essential oils. So the hemp oil is from the seed? Yes. And the CBD oil is from the pressing the flower? It's not necessarily pressing, but there's there's different methods of extractions. There's there's CO two extractions. There's butane. But yes, it is an extract from the flower. You knew all that, right, Mr. Chairman? You're fully aware. Okay. <laughs> so, talk about those two markets: um, the uh, CBD oil versus the hemp oil. Well, and can you do? Can you take both? So, if you, if you grow the plant, do you have to make a choice there? And then do you have to make a separate choice on fiber, or are there uh, well, opportunities to have multiple products? It, it, most people who are cultivating it for CBD right now only want female plants and do not want them to be pollinated and produce seed because it reduces the volume of the flower material that you have for extraction and lowers the, the total CBD content um, of, the, of that biomass, of, of that acreage. Um, now, conversely, if you're growing it for fiber and grain, you can save the, the leftover flower material and the leaves, and that can be used for CBD extraction. But fiber and grain varieties tend to have 2 or 3% CBD content, whereas specific CBD varietals are 10% or higher, therefore generating a lot more revenue per acre. Um, so you can, you can take fiber and grain crops and extract CBD from them on a much smaller scale, but if you're growing a really large volume, it's still a good value add to that crop. But if you're growing it for CBD specifically, which is what's going to get you the higher profit margins per acre, uh, you definitely want to grow CBD-specific varietals and not have them get pollinated if that makes sense. It does. It, it makes it um, complicated. This is a very complicated world. <laughs> it's, uh, um, yes, it is. It is complicated. Um, but it's, the potential is, is so tremendous. And no matter, and, and the thing that's great about the CBD production the way it is now is that if you are a small farmer and you only have a 20-acre farm, what other crop can give you that type of revenue and that kind of small acreage? You know, and then when you talk about... 20 more, acres is more in the large garden. Uh, well, not in Pennsylvania, it's not. Um, <laughs> um, but again, so there's something for everybody. There's a business model that works for every type of farmer, and I think that's what's really beautiful about it is that there's room for everybody. We have room for huge commercial scale scale production, but we also have room for even even urban farmers to be able to, you know, generate a little bit of revenue, and, and this crop can be totally inclusive, and there's a niche for everybody. Thank you. That, very interesting. I appreciate that very much. Uh, can I ask the indulgence of the chair for one more question? I'll try to keep... Okay. Uh, Chairman Seki... Um, uh, Seki, I'm sorry. Chairman Seki... Um, just in terms of, uh, from a you know, tribal standpoint, um, just your thoughts in terms of opportunities, but also challenges to, to getting going. But, you, but not, it's got to be kind of brief. I don't want the chairman to come down on me too hard. <laughs> okay. The challenges we have is in our, my oral presentation, the five steps and also the things we need for a model for tribes according to their own situation. But like in Red Lake, our economic development and our Red Lake Inc. engage in planning and due diligence regarding our lands where we can plant the hemp. Also due diligence, what kind of equipment we need to start this production. Mm -hmm. 
For example, say the, the market out there, or say we started planting 500 acres, and like this lady is saying about flower, the flowers, this is where you get the CBD oil and other products. Our first year, we figure we could make three to four million dollars. And it's gonna take three to four years to get everything going to maximize this opportunity tribes are given on this 2018 Farm Bill. And again, I wanna say miigwech to this committee for implement, implementing that for tribes to do the same thing as other states are doing. Absolutely. Uh, we want to try to help um, help you realize that opportunity. So thank you. Thanks to all of you for being here. Appreciate it very much. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hovind. And, and ranking member. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for being here. That, that concludes our hearing, but uh, I do want to thank you. The, the, uh, uh, this has been a very informative uh, conversation. Uh, sharing some of the uh, upside and some of the downside, you know, what's lurking out there. So we appreciate you taking the time to, to be with us today. To my fellow members, we ask that any additional questions you may have for the record be submitted to the committee clerk five business days from today or 5 o'clock p.m. next Thursday, August 1st. And with that, the committee's adjourned. And with that, <clears throat> a couple of uh, notable quotes from that panel. The CBD guy, I mean the, the hemp guy, the hemp secretary, they say he could be the secretary of hemp from Kentucky. I don't know his name. I should look it up. Actually, I do know his name. His name's right here. Uh, Brian Furnish. Ah, okay. That is, uh, Mitch's friend, friend or relative. I don't know. Brian Furnish, farmer, Cynthia, Cynthiana, Kentucky. And we heard the story about that. Uh, we can get his testimony. Okay, cool. Uh, very informative young fella, <laughs> young fella with the Todd, Chuck Todd bangs upstate Raider. Welcome. Thanks for joining in. Uh, yeah, Brian Furnish should be the secretary of hemp. Very uh, knowledgeable and on the, on the ball. John Deere better get their act together and start making some shit so they can, these people can grow this stuff and harvest it. Um, and, uh, there you go. There's another job, another manufacturing opportunity, hemp production equipment. Uh, Mrs. Erica Stark, executive director of national hemp association from Reading, Pennsylvania. Also very informative about the CBD versus other forms, other products in the market for hemp. CBD is dominating the market right now, of course. And uh, had an interesting no uh, note there that it's probably the best place for a small farmer to jump in right now because of the price of CBD and, and how pos popular it is despite its <laughs> challenges the fda it's funny the fda uh takes years and years and years to change the rules and that was the concern what mitch mcconnell had when he met with the fda outgoing fda chief a few weeks ago um and it said oh, well congress better do something about cbd because it's going to take years and years for the fda to change anything oh, i think 90 not even 60 days later they come out and say, oh we're gonna have new rules by the end of the summer <laughs> So, um, yes, the market for CBD is there right now, baby. It's all over the place. Everybody's got a CBD brand. Everybody's got a CBD line. Everybody's white labeling. Everybody's getting banks are getting shut down. You got to have the right processor. It's a super challenging, but man, people are just popping up everywhere. Uh, selling great, good CBD, selling crappy CBD. Make sure it's like you, you heard on that testimony. There's, you know, different varieties and trying to get CBD out of one and, uh, it's a very complicated, pl it's, Hey, it's a complicated plant. It does everything. So it should be complicated. And other, other places have figured this out. Guys, Canada's figured it out. Israel's figured out how to do the medicinal end of it. I mean, everybody's figured it out. Austra apparently New Zealand, Australia guy from Australia. Um, we've got it. 
happening now in California under Prop 64. Hemp production was basically, we we did not have a program in California prior to that. And feminized seeds, please. Feminized seeds. No, I, we don't want 23 foot tall male hemp plants blowing in the wind out here in California. We really don't. So, and nowhere, nowhere where you're going to be growing um, the girls for the medicine. And if you want to grow good CBD hemp, it's got to be icky, sticky, good stuff. You got to harvest uh, early, like he said. That's the way that stuff works with their arbitrary 0.3. It's a complicated one. It's only 0.10 of a degree of a could cause it to be illegal. <laughs> uh, you made that number up. You literally made that number up. Uh, and now decarboxylate. So let's make sure if somebody does smoke this, they're not going to get high. How high are they going to get? Um. Yeah, it's nuts. But uh, so CBD is where it's at right now for hemp. And but the long term vision, apparently, according to Mrs. Erica Stark, executive director of the National Hemp Association. Fiber, fiber. That's what it was before, before DuPont got into it. Hey, can you imagine if hemp was not buried (laughs) <laughs> if hemp was not, the hemp industry was not destroyed, it created this country and it was stopped in its tracks, in its tracks by DuPont and Hearst. And, uh, can you, and then plastic was invented. Plastic was created and you can literally make anything that's made of plastic out of hemp. So can you imagine the environmental degradation that we, we would not be uh, having, having right now if Mitch, if Mitch McConnell, I'm reading uh, Upstate Raiders quote or comment, Mitch has only greed and power motivation. This is true. Um, well, he's, he's already voted for federal hemp legalization, Alex. It is legal. The far, this, that's what they're discussing. The farm bill, this 2018 farm bill descheduled hemp. And now they want to figure out how to produce it um, under the under the new laws. But, you know, uh, laws are slow to catch up to people. Um, So, you know, the the technology is out there. The ability is out there. Manufacturing opportunities are out there. Uh, And right now, the opportunity is in CBD hemp, medicinal hemp. There are different varieties of hemp, as there are different varieties of cannabis. Um, All the same plant, but. You know, uh, they grown grown differently. They do different things and are good good for different things. And it's amazing. And I think uh, Brian Furnish um, should be uh, doing tours all over the United States. I got he's got. I know he's got uh, farm to work, but he should definitely be in the. Everybody should go see Brian. Learn how to grow some hemp. Uh, but it's going on here in California. Uh, but you feminize seeds, please. Let's just make sure that happens. Uh, and your see, and you know, we're, it's going to be very interesting to see what kind of rules come out of the FDA. Uh, since it takes so long, they're going to whip up some rules in, in a few months and throw it out there. So I'm sure it'll be overreaching, way overreaching. I mean, we can't even put, you know, they're so worried about pesticides. He's like, oh, we don't, we, there's no approved pesticides or herbicides for hemp. We want some. Great. Um, we're all worried about all the pesticides in our cannabis. You guys won't let us put California strawberries in our edibles because they come back hot. It's okay to eat the strawberry in California. No problem with all that with that pesticide on it. But if it's in an edible, you can't eat that edible. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's not. It's arbitrary. It's crazy. It's overreach. Government overreach and greed. So that was it, guys. That was the big, big, big Senate Agriculture Committee full hearing, full committee on hemp production and the 2018 Farm Bill. What does it mean? What do we do? Help. How do we do this? How do we make all this money? It's nice to see uh, tobacco farmers getting out. Of, you know, they're already losing money. So it's like, oh, hemp. Hemp cigarettes are great. Um, I mean, they're super popular in Europe. They've got issues there. Um, and, then they're, and now they're trying to, in Georgia, someone said in the chat, in Georgia, they've already done it. And in uh, North Carolina, they're trying to ban hemp cigarettes because they can't tell the difference between cannabis and marijuana or rather hemp and marijuana. So they're trying to ban hemp cigarettes. Oh, 
please. Hemp cigarettes are aw- they used to they used to back in the day uh, when half of the pharmacopoeia or f- whatever it's called uh, was hemp products, cannabis products. Uh, they used to give uh, hemp cigarettes for asthma. <laughs> and uh, there are studies that show that uh, smoking uh, cannabis is a quicker um, asthma relief than an inhaler. So it doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, upstate radar again. Shouldn't THCA decarb in THC maintain the same ratio with controlled decarb process? Yeah, I don't understand her the uh, r- the rationale behind that three times division. Um, so they what do they do? They decarb it. They see how much THC it is in it, and then they divide that by three, and then that's what the, they put out. And I, I I don't know. There she had she said there was some kind of a formula. I'll have to go back and review it and see what she said. But she said there's some kind of a formula that they're using for that that's standardized by some testing. So they they've come up with some process somewhere, which I'm sure is flawless, <laughs> just like the saliva tests, flawless in their ability to determine uh, the outcome. Um, so, but, you know, listen, Mitch, you're right. Mitch is all about profit and tobacco is dying in Kentucky and hemp is, you know, I mean, you know, this is Sam, the know, smart approaches to marijuana. Their big complaint now is because they've lost on the medical end and the danger end. Um, so they're now they're, well, watch out for big, big cannabis. They're going to be like big tobacco. Look what, look what happened to big tobacco. Meanwhile, um, an anti-cannabis politician in Utah was just busted uh, um, for being an opioid drug dealer <laughs> against cannabis in Utah, but pushing those opioids, pushing those opioids. So uh, the CBD is the uh, main upshot is CBD is dominating the hemp market right now. A uh, great entry for small farmers. If you want to get into that. And you can do it in your state, California. There's a program. Uh, it was a news we had uh, last week in the afterburn about a company up in uh, Santa, uh, Santa Barbara. I don't know where, it is. but uh, going to be growing some big acreage. New York, upstate Raider. New York is going off on hemp, right? Uh, I seem to remember that. It's just uh, more and more farmers, and obviously in Kentucky and in these tobacco states. Uh, where there's a lot to be learned, um, so let's let's go to the, let, you know why not look at the other countries that are doing it and say hey uh, can you all uh, want to do this how do we do it we're gonna we, we want to be independent hemp independent hemp God I just it just can you imagine I mean you replace first of all the cannabis industry should never make a dube tube out of plastic it should only be made out of hemp and if you're in that kind of a business I uh, go for it I think I've seen one company that is making hemp. Um, cannabis-related plastic items. Sip of coffee here. Um, so that's there. You go. There's a there's a business to get into. You got a venture capitalist. Start making some cannabis-related uh, uh, products out of hemp plastic. Hemp dube tubes, because the dube tubes and the vape cartridges are the big thing now in the landfills. Um, not a big. You know, we use. Yeah, they are. They're really bad <laughs> vape cartridges. In so many ways. Uh, Flower, man. That's why we like the reefer. (laughs) We are the reefer revolution. We like our joints. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us. I got some stuff I got to do today. Got to leave the mountain. Um, But uh, thought I'd bring you this uh, hemp hearing. So enjoy your day. Get high and have a good time. Activate your endocannabinoid system, as Bingus would say. Bingus is live. I think I'll jump over there while I'm getting ready to head out the day and listen to Bingus. And uh, we'll see you on Sunday, guys, 420. Subscribe, get notifications, give us a thumbs up if you like. And uh, we'll see you at Sunday at 420. Free the plant, free the people. Pot for peace.